in simply connected volumes. Hi, um, thank you for inviting me here. And it's really very, very beautiful place to be. So um, what I'd like to talk about is a few things related to helicity and linking number, where you take your topological invariant and you try to build it up with local contributions. So uh, maybe there's a general idea here that you often maybe have an integral and maybe you don't, uh, you're happy only when you've finished your integral, you have your final answer your topological invariant uh, linking number of two. Uh, but maybe it'll be interesting sometimes to stop early and in the middle of your calculation, do you still have something meaningful? Is that local quantity you're integrating, the integrand, meaningful? So I'll give you a few things. Winding number especially um, is a meaningful quantity. Um, if you're a topologist, okay, you, you want your final invariant quantity, it's independent of metric and so on, but I'll commit the original sin of having Euclidean metric and having uh, local quantities which might be meaningful. Um, so uh, I'll go to winding numbers and say a bit about higher order windings. Um, and then I'll get to the absolute helicity measures, which involve this poloidal toroidal uh, decomposition um, that essentially Gunnar Hornig first came up with, and, and then we worked work together on this. Um, and if I have time, I'm just because uh, there are mathematicians here who uh, well, might might get tired of all the physical description. Gauss Bonnet, I really get excited by Gauss Bonnet, and there's a <laughs> application of Gauss Bonnet in here, um, and maybe with velocity flux as well. Okay, so if I do this one, so uh, uh, application to the sun, we have all these magnetic fields and uh, uh, plasma entrained along the magnetic field lines and you'd like to know how they are entangled and braided, uh, but you don't see the entire field line, so you cannot close the curve. So you need to uh, be able to deal with open curves and still have some topological meaning. Maybe you have a surface um, that, that cuts the curves. Okay, so... Um, I'll start out with this Gauss linking integral. It's a double integral uh, dx d theta dot r over r cubed cross dy d tau. And uh, throw in, replace those tangent vectors with magnetic fields and integrate over all space. And that gives you your magnetic helicity integral. And I have maybe the last 20 years, written it this way first, rather than saying the dirty word A, because A is a <laughs> A is not gauge invariant, but this is gauge invariant as long as you integrate over all space. So um, uh, that's the real thing. And it six the Gauss linking, the Gauss linking integral is sort of a double integral, helicity integral is six dimensional. So, and I still don't really, oh, okay. And then you can use one of the, uh, use bio Savar integral Coulomb gauge to reduce it to this form that you always see. Okay. Um, but there's a, Funny thing about this, this six dimensional integral, is it really a six dimensional integral? It's not three dimensional because A is a bit dodgy. 
I'm going to claim it's five dimensional, and I still think this is weird. So somebody's going to explain it to me sometime because here the linking number looks like a double integral, but remember you can measure linking using winding. Okay, and and if you have a curve which isn't very braid-like, you could cut. You, you could take your curve and make cuts at maxima and minima in, in the vertical direction and just have a sum of, of curves that, that just go upwards or, or just go downwards. So, you know, don't worry too much about whether it looks like a braid or not. You just do the summation. And you then sum the winding numbers between all of the line segments, and then you get your linking number. So, Apart from having a, a bit of a sum here, you actually just have a one dimensional integral over winding number. Um, and you can do the same with helicity. So um, let's say you're dividing space up into parallel planes. So you're, what was it, the word foliating? space into planes, and you worry about the bz of x, bz of y, and take the derivative of, um, of the winding number between uh, the field lines going through point x and go point y, and that will give you the uh, z derivative of h h dz and h will be the integral of that. So, or integrals at top one and the bottom, maybe I'm cheating a little because that d, that phi of x, y is sort of like a two-point correlation function. I don't know. Um, that might be how I, I get a dimension reduced. Um, but there it is. It's it's a funny sort of thing. The, the, the dimension of your integral is, is not exactly where it is. Um, and there's some interesting work recently, which maybe we'll hear about later on by um, uh, Chris Pryor and David McTaggart about don't always put the BZ Bs in. Maybe this winding number is interesting. Just, just worry about how much the winding number is. Um, OK, so I'm going to start talking about this winding number in some more detail. Um, so uh, I'll want to see, is there a way of generalizing winding number, getting to any higher order invariance with winding them? Because it's sort of a local quantity. Um, uh, actually, I forgot to, let, let me go back a little bit. Forward. I can't go back to that guy's thinking. Oh, well, it doesn't really matter. Um, I, I was going to say in words that if you look at the Gauss linking integral of tangent vector dotted, the triple product tangent vector, another tangent vector, and then the and then the line segment in between. So you could think of that as a density in six dimensional space. So if your two tangent vectors are parallel, that's not really linking. Anything. Or if they're pointing to each other, they're not really linking. But if they're off, boy, that's good. It's likely it's going to be some linking. So in some ways, there is a local idea behind that triple product, which appears in Coulomb gauge. But what I want to emphasize is this idea of winding number as a sort of local thing. Um, and can we do more with it? OK, so what I'm going to do is take my, take a braid of, let's say, three curves. Uh, and have the vertical, let's call it time, 
So you have three points moving around in a plane. And let's call it the complex plane, because that'll be make things nicer. So we have three complex numbers as a function of time. And if we want angles, log of say Z3 minus Z2 and take the imaginary part, I'll divide by one over two pi i just to make it go to one if you if you go around a complete turn. So you have these nice uh, complex numbers uh, that give you the angles of between of, of these line segments between the three points. Now these three points I'm using Euclidean gauge, Euclidean. Euclidean um, uh, metric. So uh, the interior angles have to add up to pi. So you can't um, choose them completely independently. In fact, most choices are forbidden, uh, but there are a few choices that work. So now I've done this thing of putting the three angles on uh, perpendicular axes. Uh, so those are the, so each axis measures the uh, angles with respect to the x-axis, the, the uh, real real line of the complex plane of the two of the three line segments. Okay. Um, and you get this weird thing. If if you were to increase, if you were just to rotate the triangle without changing its shape, then all three angles would increase, and that's allowed, and that's perpendicular. Okay, but the forbidden angles are in the hexagons. And the allowed uh, combinations of angles are in the triangles. Okay. And in fact, the blue curve that you see there is, in fact, this Borromean like um, uh, uh, braid. Okay. And I'm putting up here just the definitions of. of, of, of getting to the angle. So lambda is the angle which can go beyond 2 pi or beyond 1. So, so normalizing by 2 pi. And um, omega is, is, is the derivative of the angles. OK. Um, so you have this neat sort of space and the proof that the Borromean braid cannot be unentangled is simply that you have it in region can't you know you can't you can't shrink it to a point okay um so i wonder and i, I don't completely know the answer is is there some sort of higher order winding which is sort of Take how how much angle you go around one of these forbidden regions, or there uh, maybe you go around several of the forbidden regions. Um, so, if I just project down to this plane where you don't care about um, adding the three, the, the sum of the three angles, um, because you could just see uniform rotation. Um, so, uh, if you some trivial examples are, aren't like the, the, the pigtail braid. Uh, on the left, you just have uniform rotation. Uh, point at that uh, single point, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, and if you just have two of the curves going around each other, it's a little bit less trivial, but you just go along one of the axes. So you really need something sort of more like the pigtail to, to go around the region. So, 
it's a nice looking space. I, I'm not, you know, there might be more to it than I realize. So this is another example um, that where it's sort of a more complicated Borromean like um, braid. And I generated this actually by using a Hamiltonian where um, you take one of those omega that the imaginary part to zero and that gives you some equations that, that you can use generate the motion. But um, usually when you do that, the curves crash into each other. But occasionally you can get the right, uh, get something that goes like this. So that's this idea of higher order winding. You can actually get some higher order uh, linking numbers sort of on the route to Chen's iterated integrals. And I think this relates a lot to Konsevich integrals, um, where you, you take cross ratios and um, that, that they're all functions of each other when you have four complex numbers. And you can get a second order invariant that way because V is, is strictly a function of U. Uh, and I won't go into all the details, but but you, if it bothers you that cross ratios have four different complex numbers, you can send one to infinity and play around with the remaining three. And you, you can get a third order invariant that way. Um, I don't know. I never got beyond cross ratios, so, so, so maybe there's there's a way of going further um, using cross ratios. I think. Possibly, if you go further in into Konsevich integrals, you know, all those higher order invariants or Chen iterator integrals. See, this, this, these are I think the first steps on the way. Um, anyhow. Um, I'll get back to helicity. And um, so there are equi a few equivalent ways of getting, obtaining helicity one plane at a time or one sphere at a time. Um, and this is where you're trying to avoid using uh, a particular gauge. Um, for that integral of a dot b. Um, one way I, I have of, of, of describing this is that there's this old tale where you have uh, 10 to the 100 monkeys all sitting in front of their typewriters or word processors typing things. And most of them type nonsense. It just, but a few of the monkeys, one of them types all the plays of Shakespeare, right? One of them types Planet of the Apes. Um, you, you know, uh, lots of them type Shakespeare, but with one typo. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and the same with gauges. There are infinite number of gauges. Most of them are nonsense, but there are just one or two, just a few of them that actually are meaningful. Maybe they tell you about winding numbers or, or, or whatever, you know. Um, so that, that's what we're trying to do is, is focus on the ones that, that actually you can interpret in a physical way. Um, so uh, you can do the relativity thing, which um, was d done first, that, that, that you take your uh, true field here and you don't know what's underneath, but you don't care because you're going to subtract the potential field um, up, uh, and now you can integrate over all space and the answer is independent field downstairs. The second way is, which I'll be talking about a bit more, is we can express Lysias linking between boloidal flux and toroidal flux. Uh, there, let's see, wait a second. 
just going to do um, oh, see a slide or something. Um, the third way is the winding gauge. So you're dividing up your field lines um, into pieces that, that maybe you cut them at, at maximum minima and then count all the windings between every pair of field lines. Okay. And there is a, a, a pretty simple gauge called the winding gauge, which is equivalent to this. And if we're dividing things up into parallel planes or concentric spheres, these all give the same answer. That, that's a nice thing. Um, the problem is when things aren't so simple, you don't have that symmetry and you divide things when it's not parallel planes or concentric spheres. Okay, so um, I'm going to get away from winding number a bit and try to do this different thing, which is linking a poloidal by toroidal flux. And I should mention this is an unfortunate choice of notation. If my history is right, I might correct me if I'm wrong. I think this might be due to Chandrasekhar, this poloidal toroidal, but I, I'm not quite sure. The problem is the uh, people like fusion scientists who, who work in tori have their own definitions of poloidal and toroidal. And so you, you can get confused if you're used to the, um, uh, uh, for if you're working in a donut, uh, toroidal is the long way around and poloidal is the short way around. And here, well, I'll tell you what poloidal and toroidal mean. The essentially blue is toroidal and red is poloidal. Okay, so that's what we'll do. So uh, we're going to, I have just to, Introduce some notation. This script L would be Z hat cross gra gradient in planar geometry or R hat cross gradient in spherical. And then you can write decompose a magnetic field in terms of its toroidal and poloidal com uh, contributions. Um, and so, so you have your field in terms of two. Uh, scalar potentials T and P. Okay, and I'll talk about what they mean in the moment, but you can then get your helicity as to integral LT dot LP in between two parallel planes or between two concentric spheres. And um, I, I should also point out that it's a nice representation in that. Well, I don't. Oops. In, in that poloidal and toroidal fields are orthogonal. Okay, so uh, the vector potential looks like this, uh, or um, may not be the only one used, but it's the simplest one. And the, the, uh, Del squared at the Laplacian in the plane or in the sphere of P, it gives you Bn, and the Laplacian of T gives you Jn. So the poloidal scalar potential is in, in a sense generated by the normal to the plane, and T is generated by the normal current. Okay, so if I go back here, um, the poloidal flux is red. That has the BN. B is coming out of the sphere. And the toroidal flux has to be parallel to the sphere or the plane, but it's generated by any kind of currents, uh, electrical currents going on. Okay. Um, it also means the poloidal flux has to sort of be, it, it, it may have components parallel to the plane or the sphere, but their gradients, a poloidal magnetic field, are gradients within the sphere or the plane. Um, but the toroidal flux is allowed to do what it wants. Um, so you're not going to get 
circles in the in the poloidal flux in, inside the plane. Okay. Then they'll link each other. So um, the physical meaning is is that the helicity is the linking of these poloidal and toroidal fields. Um, so you have a, a different way of doing things. That the, the winding number, you take the real field lines, the actual field lines, and see how they wind about each other. Here you've divided up your field in what, what seems to be a sensible way. Um, and it's the interlinking of these two fields. But these Poloidal and turtle fields don't look like the field lines. It's sort of a rather different way of doing things. Um, okay. So um, I can sort of picture what T is doing. Okay, so the helicity was LT dot LP, L was Z cross del. Integrate by parts, I can uh, Take a curl essentially and hit LP with it, and that gives you the poidal uh, or the perpendicular part of the poidal field. So that's BZ. I read T, so, so the linking helicity is um, T times BZ. Okay, so what I have, the, the color here represents the uh, value of T. So what's going on here? You have a Flux tube that's at an angle. Now, if I put in a perpendic, so that means there's parallel magnetic field parallel to the surface because this is at an angle. So if I have a perpendicular flux tube here, um, it's awesome. it's positive. But if I put a flux tube here, then negative. Okay, so uh, T tells you if I have a, a perpendicular field, positive perpendicular field, T tells you whether I'm going to have a positive crossing or a negative crossing, as seen from uh, angles where you see a crossing. Okay, so that's sort of what T is. This I have on the right is LT, uh, Z, Z hat cross del grad T. So it looks sort of like a dipole. That, that's what the total field is doing. Okay. Okay, so that's sphere, that's, so far that's spheres and, and that doesn't give you anything different. What I've talked about so far, doesn't give you anything different from either winding gauge or relative helicity. Now try something that is genus zero, but 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 not symmetric. Um, I'm not sure what the use of oops. I'm not sure what the use of the funny face is, but you might want to work in a box. Or you might want to work, say, in the top half of the sun or the earth or something like that, and then it's important to, to, to deal with uh, some um, non-spherical polynomial. Uh, okay, so the normal of component of the curl, um, I'm gonna, in, in addition to that script L, Z cross, or R cross del, I'm gonna have C, which is the normal component of the curl, so you're, Foliating space with these weird shapes. Um, and this is the normal component. Um, and then we could try to invert this operator. Well, that's not unique because it's inverting a, uh, uh, you know, a derivative, but we could make it unique by specifying that. Uh, in each surface, uh, V is parallel to surface and divergence free. So that, that's a nice way of doing it. Okay. Um, 
So what I'm going to do is take the perpendicular current, curl B, and then take its D inverse operator. So I'm getting a toroidal field, so it's parallel inside the surface, divergence free inside the surface, but the polaroidal field is everything else. And that's where you run into problems. Um, because the, with a sphere or a plane, this poloidal field is supposed to have um, JPN equals zero. Okay, that's all right because so, well, uh, yeah, so BP doesn't have any perpendicular current. Okay. Um, but it still doesn't obey the rules. Part part of the problem is with spheres and planes, the curl of the toroidal field is poloidal, the curl of the poloidal field is toroidal and, and, and so on, but that's not going to be true now. Um, but it doesn't behave because the obvious vector potential uh, D inverse of BN gives an unwanted field parallel to the surface. So you get a spurious perpendicular current. So you've got to be very careful in getting a vector potential for the um, uh, for BN. So right, so BN is not uh, so you need to add a correction term to the poloidal field so that it doesn't, so B poloidal, remember, has no perpendicular current. Um, if B wiggle is D inverse of BN, uh, well, is curl of D inverse BN, um, then you need an extra un, uh, BS, which, which would get rid of the undesired perpendicular current. Okay. So, um, so what you find is that when you have a funny shape, um, your there is an extra linking of the poloidal field with the shape field. So it used to be um, that the helicity was the vector potential of the poloidal field dotted with the toroidal field. Now I need an extra, uh, an extra little contribution here. Okay, so the helicity goes a bit weird when you do these shape field things. Okay. Um, okay, so that's a sort of a warning when you have a funny shape, you, you, you your poloidal toroidal representation needs modification. I'm going to now spend the rest of the talk having some fun with genus zero foliations. That's where I can get to this Gauss-Bonnet stuff. So, okay, at first, um, I need a little bit of a review of Felicity Flux for what I'm doing. I'm not going to talk directly about Felicity Flux, but just indirectly, I need that this is the time derivative of the Felicity and um, uh, in, inside a volume. OK. Um, and it you can describe it in terms of two terms. One is twisting your flux if you have a flux tube, and the second is a sort of orbit term where you take two endpoints of your curves and move them around each other. Okay. Um, so for the moment, I'll stay with a symmetric sphere. I'll get back to irregular surfaces in a few minutes. 
Okay, so you have a sort of a twist term or a spin term, and you have an orbit term, if you like. Okay. Uh, so let's see, and in a, and also point out if if I'm dividing spin, um, my flux up into flux tubes. Um, what if I just take one? What if I want, say, the helicity between two concentric spheres or between two parallel planes? I might just, if I want to be funny, take two curves that are both two flux tubes that are going upwards. And then that means there are some magnetic monopoles beneath the lower surface and two between the upper surface. If I have these two um, microphones are both pointing upwards. And if that's all I have, then there's some monopoles underneath the table, right? Because uh, I don't know where they come back down. I'm just looking at two at a time. So, um, but if you just have one flux element, uh, you can drive your vector potential, and then that's in all the textbooks and so on. But there's a funny trick going on. Um, there, there should be a monopole under the table for that vector potential, because there's just one flux tube coming through. Um, so there's a return flux, but there's plenty of area in the plane, so the return magnetic flux at any point is infinitesimal. And that's how you get away, away with it, to say there's, no. okay. So the question I have is, supposing you have a genus zero surface, how do you distribute your return flux when you're trying to figure out the vector potential? Okay. That's where we need gauss Bonnet. So first I'll do a nice sphere. And I'm going to use a trick to try to figure out what the vector potential is. Um, so I want the vector potential of due to this, say this top point here. Um, now, if I have a loop, let's say I rotate the sphere uniformly, the loop isn't getting twisted. I'm just rotating everything uniformly, so the net helicity flux will be zero. But there's a spin term on the top, and there's a orbit term, and they should they should all add up to zero. Okay. So the spin of the foot point at the pole is one turn, and that gives you a helicity flux, say minus y squared. Uh, you're rotating it at um, clockwise, anti-clockwise. The, if the opposite foot point is very near the North Pole, then it also spins once. And so the orbit, but the orbit terms count will cancel these two out because they'll, they'll orbit each other. You just imagine uh, being at the North Pole and two points m moving around each other. Okay. What if, though, uh, well, the way I've drawn it, it's not at the North Pole? Um, let's say one of the foot points is on the equator and then it doesn't spin at all. So the orbit term has to be half of what it is near the pole. Okay. Uh, and if it were at the op at the south pole, then it would spin in a negative way and the orbit term would have to compensate accordingly. So in fact, so what we're doing is um, has something to do with geodesic deviation. How much does something spin when you actually move it, uniformly rotate the sphere? Um, okay, so um, let's say we have uh, two flux tubes coming out of a sphere, inner sphere going to the outer sphere. Um, we want a, a return flux in order to have no monopoles, and it's nice with the sphere. You just distribute the return flux 
equally on the uh, equally everywhere. So the vector potential um, would be the, so, so um, here is your flux B1, which is inside foot point one, B over A is B1, and over the entire sphere you are uh, distributing your return flux. Okay. Uh, and then you can get the vector potential. And then this vector potential is exactly what you need in, when, when you try to calculate these spin and orbit terms. It all works out fine. Um, the orbit term would be give you one plus cos theta and, and so on. I won't go through all the, the things, but the point is the spin is 2 pi minus the geodesic deviation. Okay. So, um, sometimes that's called angle defect. Yeah. Okay, and that's sort of where you're going to need Gauss Bonnet because you want to get your geodesic deviation right. And geodesic deviation depends on where the distribution of curvature is. So um, the total curvature K enclosed by a closed curve on a simply connected surface is 4 pi or minus geodesic deviation. So the conclusion is to get your vector potential correct on a weird surface uh, due to one foot point, uh, the return flux that should be distributed according to Gauss curvature, not uniformly um, with area to Gauss curvature. Now, of course, you, you do have positive foot points and negative foot points, and all your return flux eventually cancels out. So you, maybe you don't worry about this, but if you just have one flux tube and you want to calculate its vector potential, then, then you have to worry about gauss -Bonnet. Yeah, so so that so if you had a box, all your return flux is at the corners. I'm going to just point out, since I have a few minutes left, one more fun thing with genus zero surfaces, because I realized later on people will be talking about interesting things to do with tori and so on. But there, there is something fun in gene zero. Okay, so if you have uh, flux between two planes, you can divide the helicity up into self and mutual helicity. Self helicity is twist plus writhe, and the mutual is the mutual winding. Okay, what happens though if we have flux between par parallel uh, spheres. So I'm not going to care about the yellow bit, I'm just caring about red and blue. Well, the red part could be twisted and kinked, so like self felicity, but the red and blue are moving around each other, so there's some mutual elicity. But they're not so easy to separate because we could move, say, the blue one around the bottom of the sphere and put it on the other side. So now your mutual helicity seems to have reversed its sign. Okay. And in fact, what happens is the by moving it around, it, it also twists up as you move it around. Um, you, you can play around with one of these wires when, when, when you get home and, and try that and you'll see that it does um, twist up the wire. So uh, you have to watch out with self and mutualicity when you, when you have spherical regions like that. Anyhow, I'll stop there. So we'll have 10 more minutes for coffee.